Fungi are everywhere. The nice thing about cultivating mushrooms is that we can choose our preferred fungi so that we can do more foraging instead of buying. My talking, along with reishi, is, are, those are two mushrooms we can't import into the islands, but they're already here. I checked with the Department of Agriculture to see if we can culture mushrooms that are already here, and that is entirely permissible. We can do that. We just can't import them. So that's what I've been trying to find. It's mushrooms that are here, that are already locally adapted to our various microclimates, that can be cultured. I didn't add King Strotharia to this PowerPoint presentation yet, but that's one mushroom uh, that we're going to grow today. It's called Red Wine Cap, because the, the cap of the mushroom looks like a porter red wine. It's a choice edible. It sometimes can grow as large as my hat in a, in a garden bed, and it can grow at all elevations. It prefers colder temperatures. So if you're, if you're in a really hot environment, like parts of Lower Puna, you might want to grow it on the north side of a building or your garden shed. We need to wash everything, including our hands and all tools, not once, not twice, but three times. And that makes sure that most of the bacteria and other competing fungi are reduced to a small percentage. It doesn't have to be entirely sterile. These mushrooms, especially the oyster mushroom, are, like I said, are very aggressive. But we want to balance things in our favor. So we'll wash things three times. We also want to give the mycelium food to extend into. Just like us, they have stomachs. Just like us, they like to eat a lot. Well, just like me, they like to eat a lot. And we want to be sure we feed them either the same material that they're initially being grown on or even better material over time. For example, coffee grounds can be grown initially to grow mushrooms, which is a good initial candy-like source for them. And then we can move the coffee ground mycelium, mycelium that's colonizing the coffee grounds, on the wood chips, which is a longer term carbohydrate-like source for them. So it's analogous to eating sugar canes at first and then feeding on acorns or ulu. Ulu is a much better longer term food for us. We also want to make sure that the substrate we're feeding, the food that we're feeding to our mushrooms is fairly fresh. We don't want it to be too fresh in terms of wood because most wood has antifungal compounds in, in it that hangs out for the first two weeks in logs and two days in wood chips. What, what are some sources of contamination? The, the media itself, the media in this case would, could be our wood chips that might be growing a competitive fungus already. Maybe our straw is contaminated. Maybe the air is contaminated. We don't want to sneeze into our, <laughs> our fresh wood chips or, or our bag of mycelium, for obvious reasons. Sometimes the mycelium itself is contaminated. Usually you'll see a green competitive fungus in the mycelium. But there's a filter patch here that's allowing the mycelium to off-gas. Mycelium and mushrooms in general consume, they inhale oxygen just like us and exhale carbon dioxide just like us. Is it like a thing that we throw in a coffee um, container where it can breathe a little bit? Or? Right. That filter patch allows the mycelium to exchange gases. Sometimes we ourselves can be contamination sources if we are wearing a dirty shirt or a dirty hat. Finger. Or, yeah, it's, it's important when we're out there, after we wash our hands three times, to put our elbows into our arms. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
to have that, have that uh, surgery, surgical <laughs> hand position, and also to wash in between our, our fingers. Sometimes also time is a factor in contamination. Like I said, it's best to have fresh wood chips and fresh logs. What about water? Water. I'm presuming that the water here is not chlorinated. Is that true? What about the rain? Rain water. Sure. River water. Water is another factor. I'll add that to the next slideshow. The rain catch different spores from the air. We're going to be cooking the water today. So we're going to, we're going to be pasteurizing the water. And that renders the water fairly benign to us. Would distilled water be clean enough? Distilled water would be fine. It's preferred to have some nutrients in the water, though. Oh, okay. so ideally, we'd be using well water. This is what shiitake looks like emerging from logs. <gasps> These are mushrooms we, we cultivated on shi'i, or oak, oh, in, on the East Coast. You can also inoculate logs with sawdust. I'll show you some of those tools up top, too. But this is much more funny. You can use a hammer and melted wax. Much, much more entertaining. We were thinning out a forest after grad school that was owned by one of our uh, grad school colleagues. This is mushroom cultivation can have multiple functions. So we're, we're thinning out the forest and growing food from wood on that thinned out wood. So the forest is appreciative of this work. Ideally, we'd be harvesting our logs at, at a minimum of four weeks prior to the time, a uh, maximum four, four weeks prior to the time that we're going to do our inoculation stations. And the log length is best about to be about three or four feet at most, just so it's not too awkward to handle the logs. If you have log diameters that are larger than eight inches, you don't get mushrooms producing very quickly. You have to wait multiple years. And if you have logs that are too thin, they don't produce very much at all. So four to eight inch diameter uh, logs is what we'll be using today. You can either use a drill bit or an angle grinder adapter. Uh, uh, that's what I'm using today. Having an adapted angle grinder speeds up the process by a factor of 10. You'll see. You'll see. But if all you have is a, a, a standard drill bit and a drill, that'll work also. Usually I try to space the holes about six inches apart. You could go closer if you have a lot of extra wooden dowels. But this, this will suffice and we're drilling them in a checkerboard fashion all around the log. So that by doing this checkerboard pattern, this is how we often lay out plants and garden beds too, right? We're clustering the holes as close together as possible for our optimal infection, our preferred infection. Then we put in the dowels in our, at our inoculation station. Usually I like to do this for a large inoculation sessions when we do 200 logs in a day we have a, an assembly line then we whack the log we whack the dowel into the log with the hammer and then cap it with wax my preferred wax is beeswax because it's local if the wax falls off two weeks after inoculation that is long enough for the preferred infection that we're wanting to get a foothold in the wood. We also want to wax one end of the log. If we're just growing one log, like you guys will be going home today with one log, you could put the other non-waxed end into the ground, into preferably sand, not soil because soil has too many contaminants in it. And the other waxed end will keep out other contaminants floating around in, in the air. The reason we don't wax the bottom end that we're putting into the ground is so that the log can uptake moisture from the ground. 
and that will reduce our need to water them. The wa the, these logs will, will dry out. And if the logs dry out, the mycelium will die. That's important to know.